Thank you so much. Okay, so before we start at all, uh, I just want to say a big thank you for the invitation to come here. It's a real pleasure to be here with you in Kyoto. So thank you to Professor Kihara and thank you to JAR for all of the organisation to make this possible. Um, and so yes, this is my second visit to Japan and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, one thing I would say, if you, if you want to talk to me, please just call me Ian. Um, don't call me Professor Douglas, I prefer you to just call me Ian. Um, that's just my preference. So, nice to you. I'm Masao Iwagami. Uh, I'm at the moment an assistant professor in the Department of Health Service Research in Tsukuba. And also an assistant professor, uh, honorary assistant professor of London School of Hygiene and assisting distance learning courses of pharmacoepidemiology and non-infectious disease epidemiology. And I spent five years in the UK, one year master for epidemiology, in which he's now the course director. And also four years PhD under supervision of two nephrologists and him. And just came back last year. And then I thank I mean, Ja and Ian for inviting me to, to talk in the Friday morning. And if, if I believe that my role is to, to support the fluent communication between Ian and you. So that, so I, I, to be honest, I was very bad at English five years ago. Now still not very perfect, but if you have any questions in English or in Japanese, you can give questions in Japanese so that I, I will help translate <laughs> and to make a fluent communication between students and Ian. Yeah. Nice to see you. Thank you, Marcel. Okay, well, thank you all and welcome again. Um, what I want to do, first of all, is before we talk about any e-health data or drugs, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and bring you greetings from, from there. Okay, so it's a, it's a very large school of public health in the UK and we were named in the UK they have a competition every year and in 2016 we were named the University of the Year in, and this is quite unusual for a, a very specialised institution like the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine um, so we were very pleased to be awarded this and we've also received some further prizes in 2017 and we're ranked sixth in the world for both social sciences and public health. Um, so we're very proud of these, of these achievements. And the school itself was, was formed back in the late 1800s. And originally, the school was in fact a hospital ship. So it wasn't even on land. It was a boat in the sea from the time when lots of people from the UK would go overseas to do business or whatever it was they were doing and then when they came back they would bring back diseases from all over the world by accident and so this ship was outside the country so that people with their diseases from all over the world could be treated on this ship and then over the years they gradually moved on land to London and then in the 1920s the building that we are in today was built and so we've been there ever since. So that was the origin of the school. Um, I'm not sure we seem to be having some, some slide difficulties. Um, so here we go, so we were founded in 1899. Um, as well as doing research on tropical diseases, the school or members of the school also pioneered research into the effects of cigarette smoking. And so it was two researchers at the school Richard Doll and Austin Bradford Hill, who originally realised that smoking was the cause of lung cancer due to some groundbreaking research they did. And particularly Austin Bradford Hill was also one of the very early pioneers of the randomised controlled trial. So they were all um, originally led by, by people from the school. Um, we now have around 3,000 staff at the school, some based in London, but many based overseas. For example, we have two 
large units in both the Gambia and Uganda and we have around 4,000 students at the school and they are from over 150 different countries. So for example, I organise the MSc in Epidemiology and we have 60 students a year and they come from around 30 different countries. So it's a very international, multicultural environment and so as well as learning about epidemiology and statistics, we learn a very large amount from the students themselves about the countries they come from, the different health problems that they have, and it's one of the big strengths of the school is that it's such a diverse international population. Um, doesn't matter that you can't see the slides because at the minute it's just me telling you things about the school, so it's okay. Um, the, the key mission of the school is to improve health and health equity, so equality in health, in both the UK but also internationally. And we have a lot of key partnerships throughout the world of people doing similar kinds of research to help us to achieve those kinds of aims. And so there's another reason why it's a great pleasure to be here in Kyoto and to meet many of you. So we, we're having a slight, <laughs> slight technical, <laughs> technical hitch, as you can see, but we'll get there. Mm -hmm. What else can I be telling you about whilst we're waiting? Uh, one thing I'm going to say, uh, Jury, <laughs> thank you, Musa. So it's clear that lots of you are from a background where you are doing electronic health record research. Some of you are not involved in that research. Either background is fine for this course and I think that you could come from either background and hopefully learn. What I would say is, if you, particularly if you are involved in that kind of research and there's anything you want to ask me about during the two days but it isn't covered, then just come and talk to me about it anyway during breaks or you could maybe get my email address but I'm very happy to talk to you about anything that isn't covered on the, the presentations. Okay, so how are we doing? Um, we're nearly there. So the, <laughs> so the school also has, do you all have versions of my presentation on your screens? Oh, so you can see what I might be talking about. So we also at the school have, as well as students that study in London, we have students that study from distance and we have distance learning courses. We also have a large range of free online courses that students can take all over the world. So feel free to have a look at things that are available and things that might be of use to you. And then finally, I bring you greetings from the Electronic Health Records Research Group at the London School of Hygiene. This was, on any one day, you will not find everybody from the EHR group available for a photograph. So this is probably half or two thirds of the group, I would say is probably true. There are probably 40 or 50 people at the school who are using electronic health records to do their main research and amongst those maybe 10 or 12 only do pharmacoepidemiology but broader across the group many people will do a range of projects and sometimes they will do pharmacoepidemiology so there's a, a broad range of research interests within that group. Okay so that's a little bit about the School of Hygiene but I also want to bring you greetings from the original area that I come from in the UK and I wonder if any but there's no reason you would I wonder if anybody can guess from these four pictures where I may come from in the UK any ideas do you recognize what any of these things are Yorkshire yes who said Yorkshire pudding it is. So this is Yorkshire pudding. Um, anybody heard of Yorkshire pudding? This is a savoury batter that we cook and then we eat with roasted meat. 
and gravy, other things. Do you know what this is? Apparently this is the number one favourite dog breed in the world. It's the Yorkshire Terrier. You can guess where I'm from. It's a place called Yorkshire. Um, this is, well, I'll show you what they all are. So Yorkshire Pudding, Yorkshire Terrier, the Yorkshire Dales. And this is a, a kind of hat called a flat cap, which originated in Yorkshire, apparently in the 1300s and hasn't changed much in style ever since. And if you're interested, so this is the, the county, it's in the northern part of England. And this is where I'm from. Okay. Right. So that's the introductions and the welcomes. What I'll do now is tell you a little bit more about the course outline. So starting with today, the first session is about pharmacovigilance and pharmacoepidemiology, so we'll get to that in just a moment. The second session this afternoon, I'm going to move on to thinking about how we use electronic health records to do risk management and pharmacoepidemiology. So why we need to think about using EHRs and how they go beyond randomised trials in their uses we'll think about a range of different kinds of situations where this kind of evidence is needed and I'll also talk a bit about what I see as the future for EHR research in pharmacoepidemiology. Okay? And then for those of you who are able to join us on Friday, so first of all, Masao will give you a presentation about a case study of medication harm assessment and how we would do that within an EHR database and detailed steps that you'd need to think through in order to do it. And then the second, two, the third, sorry, the second and third sessions on Friday will be two methodological sessions. The first is around self-controlled methods and these are methodologies where individuals act as their own controls and they're very widely used with EHR records. We'll talk about when you would choose to do it, why you would do it, and what the key advantages are over other kinds of methods. And then finally, we'll talk about propensity scores. Again, you may have heard the use of propensity scores. They may be less familiar to you. So we'll think about what they are, when you would use them to do a research study, how they're used, and how it compares with using a multivariable approach to an analysis. Okay, so we're still having difficulty, but um, anyway. So on now to the first session. So we're now thinking about pharmacovigilance and pharmacoepidemiology. So I'm going to start by telling you some of the history that has led to modern day pharmacovigilance. We'll talk about spontaneous reporting, what this is, how it's used, and the strengths and weaknesses. Um, we won't be talking about history leading to modern epidemiology, that's wrong. Uh, we will then talk about pharmacoepidemiology and how it fits with pharmacovigilance and a few examples. We'll talk about the need for risk management planning and how this is done worldwide in order to make sure our medicines are as safe as possible. And I'll also talk about what I see as some of the main challenges to us as people doing EHR research in this area. Okay. This was something that happened in the early 1960s and it was probably the biggest trigger for modern day pharmacovigilance. Does everybody know what this picture represents, this photograph? Any ideas what this is? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So this is the thalidomide disaster from the early 1960s. Um, at this stage, there was no formal process for monitoring the safety of medicines. Okay. So 
what happened was a, a doctor from Australia called Dr. McBride wrote to the journal The Lancet and he had made some interesting observations. He, he knew that birth defects were relatively uncommon and he thought that they happened in around 1.5% of babies normally. But he found that over a short period of time that he'd observed many more cases of birth defects than you would expect and that they happened to women who'd been given thalidomide during pregnancy. And he went on to describe a pattern in these birth defects. Now at the time, as I say, this was the only way people could raise awareness of this kind of problem in a, you know, there was no other way of doing this. There were no regulatory authorities that you could get involved. You had to do this kind of thing. And this is why thalidomide was such a disaster. We could spend the whole of the afternoon talking about thalidomide and there are books written on the subject which are very, if you're interested in drug safety, a very interesting read about the various steps that went wrong during the process of thalidomide becoming available. It was probably one of the biggest tragedies in modern medicine and people have tried to estimate how many people were affected worldwide by this disaster and the, the estimate is somewhere between 10 and 20,000 babies who were born with birth defects due to thalidomide. In fact we think that this is only the tip of the iceberg because the effects of thalidomide were so severe that in many instances they led to fetuses that would have, have died before they were born because the defects were so severe. So in fact, 10 to 20,000 is probably a, a very major underestimate. Way more people were affected than that. At the time, the expectations for clinical testing were much lower and the expectations for animal studies were much lower. So the, the number of species that you have to test a drug on was lower. Um, and then there was no formal method for screening for adverse events once a drug was launched. So at the time a drug is licensed, even now, even with our very pre our precise way of measuring the safety of medicine during development, we still have very limited information on the potential harms of treatments. I would say that we also tend to have incomplete information on the expected benefits of a treatment. So animal testing has much improved. We now have to test on more than one species and there are, we, we know now much more about how to interpret these results, how to do the testing to try to preempt the problems of thalidomide. Randomised trials are obviously conducted before a drug can be licensed. Any ideas how many people, or a guess at how many people will have been exposed to a new drug by the time it's given a licence? Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, a few thousand, okay. That's at best, okay. and this is probably the most common, but certainly for some of the treatments for rarer diseases, it will be even fewer, a lower number. So the problem is only a small number of people have been exposed, and the types of people exposed will not be representative of the types of people that will receive the treatment in routine care. So we will often exclude the elderly, children, pregnant women, people who've got liver or kidney problems and people that take lots of different medications or who have several illnesses. Now that to me sounds like exactly the people that we will then treat with the medication but in fact we leave them out of the randomised trials 
for good reasons, because we want to do our best to estimate the ideal benefit of the treatment under controlled conditions. But it means that at the point of licensing, we're missing information on all of these kinds of people. It's very unusual that we would have experience of treating people for a long period of time when the drug is licensed. So if you imagine a treatment for type 2 diabetes, we may expect people to take this for 10, 20 more years. We have no idea what will be the long-term consequences of taking the treatment for a long period. Um, so we also may have got the wrong dose. Remember, if you are working in a drug company, then some point during phase one and two, you have to decide which is the best dose for the treatment. And this will be based on several considerations. You will want to be able to have the best chance of demonstrating a good effect, a good beneficial effect. And sometimes this means that we may have selected a dose that is higher than we really need. And it may only be some years later that we find out what in fact would be the ideal dose. So at the point of licensing, we've demonstrated efficacy. And this is the, the ideal effect under control conditions. But we know nothing about effectiveness which we'll come back to later on, but which is in fact what happens when we give the treatment in routine care, and it can be quite different to efficacy. Okay, so there's, there are limitations at the point of licensing which we need to try to do something to address. Which brings us to pharmacovigilance. So I've put up a definition here which I quite like. It's, it's quite an old one, but I, I think it describes what we do in pharmacovigilance. So it's the science and activities relating to the detection, evaluation, understanding and prevention of adverse drug reactions or any other problems to do with the treatment. Okay? I would say this is a very broad field and that the evidence that we consider for pharmacovigilance can come from any source. Sometimes in the United States, pharmacovigilance has been considered to be only to do with spontaneous reports. But we think it's actually much broader than this and that we can get evidence from any source. But I do want to talk a little bit about spontaneous reporting systems. Who is already familiar with spontaneous reporting? I know some of you will be. Hands up if you know, about, know anything about spontaneous reporting. Not, no, not so many of you. Okay. Well, welcome. Come on in. Um, so spontaneous reporting, I think the first system was in fact launched in the UK in 1964. Now, do you remember what year the thalidomide disaster was? 61. Yeah, 1961. So even with that massive disaster, it took three years to put in place the process and the governing bodies to make sure we could prevent the next thalidomide. I think that's not great that it took three years, but still, this is what happened. Um, spontaneous reporting is all about collecting individual case reports of suspected adverse drug reactions. And these reports can be made by a health professional, they can be made by patients themselves, they can come from pharmacists. Basically, anybody who's involved with the care of a patient who sees a potential adverse drug reaction can report that adverse reaction. And they'll report it either to the drug company who makes the drug or to the regulatory authority in their country. And each country will have its own system where they try to make it widely known to the population that this process is available okay. and it acts as an early warning system for potential drug problems. One thing to think about is the concept of causality. So in a spontaneous reporting system we're asking people 
to make a personal decision about what happened to somebody after they received a medication and then a harmful event happened. Because we only want people to tell us about it if they suspect that there's a causal relationship and that the medication itself caused the harmful event. So it's a, philosophically causality is actually a really tricky subject, but we're simply asking people for them to make this decision about whether or not this was causal. It means that we then have a very large quantity of these individual reports where for each of them somebody suspected that there was a causal relationship. This may not always be correct, that, that sort of doesn't matter. What matters is that somebody thought that there was a causal relationship. Now, it's possible that we can look at individual case reports themselves to try to make an assessment of maybe a group of cases, but it isn't practical for us to assess all individual spontaneous reports. And my next slide illustrates this. So, you, although you can't really see the numbers, this is, over the last 10 years, the number of spontaneous reports received by the United States FDA. So this is their Drug Regulatory Authority. And back in 2009, they had around 500,000 reports a year. Okay. Last year, they had just over 2.2 million individual reports. Now, nobody can read all of those and make sense of them. It's just not possible. You may be able to take a small group of them and try to make sense of them, but how would you know which ones to even start on? Well, over the last 20 years or so, we've developed some methodologies to try to use these data to help us to figure out what may be genuine problems with medications. There are different views on how useful spontaneous reports are. I believe that they genuinely are the best early warning system that we have for generating hypotheses or signals of potential problems. And people have tried various methodologies to try to make sense of them. We can calculate a reporting rate so we can count how many reports of a reaction have been made and estimate how many people have been exposed to the treatment. Now this is quite difficult to do and can be very difficult to interpret what the numbers mean because we will never know the precise number of adverse reactions that have really happened and it's also surprisingly difficult to measure within a given population how many people have received a treatment. So reporting rates, not that useful in my opinion. Um, more recently, methods of disproportionality have been developed, which look like they are more useful. And this next sl slide briefly explains what we mean by disproportionality. So the idea is that within a database, we store all of the adverse reactions for every drug available within a country or a region. So it's going to have a lot of data in it. If we find that for the drug that we're interested in, drug A, that 12% of all reports received for that drug are for, say, liver failure, okay, what we do is we compare that 12% with the proportion of cases reported for every other drug on the database, and we see what proportion of those are liver failure. So, if within our wider database, only 4% of cases are for liver failure. The implication is that liver failure is being reported more frequently with drug A than it is with all other treatments. And we would then say, this is something that should worry us. We're not saying it's definitely causal, but we're saying it's a signal 
or a hypothesis that we then need to test further. One of the great advantages of this methodology is that nobody has to read any individual case report to do it. All we have to do is store the data in such a way that both the, the drug is recorded and the adverse reaction is recorded. And then these calculations are actually very simple to do. So it's a way of using these very large quantities of data to generate hypotheses. Okay. Okay, so some strengths and weaknesses of the spontaneous reporting systems. One of the nice things, it captures suspicion amongst anybody who's involved with healthcare. So it's capturing that suspicion using people's brain power. Everybody exposed to the treatment, in theory, can be included. So there's no reason why you have to exclude anybody from this data collection process. So it's very broad. Every single exposure or treatment in your country or your region, again, can be included. So it's a very inclusive kind of study. It can be very good for detecting rare adverse reactions. One thing that can be very useful are individual case reports that are published in the medical literature. So often uh, a doctor or some other health professional will see an unusual case and they decide to write it up a little bit like the example of Dr McBride in Australia and they will write this up, send it to a journal and these are often the first signs we have of a, a rare adverse reaction. The disadvantages are we can't measure the size of an effect. We can't know how often this reaction is occurring using this process. We have no idea. Um, the rate of the, the, the quality of reporting can be quite poor. So for a report to be valid, all it has to have are a, a patient, which can simply mean saying, I had a female patient. That would then become a valid report, potentially. We wouldn't know if the patient was six months old or 92 years old. Could be either, but it would be a valid report. It also has to have a named drug and a named adverse reaction. And as long as it has those three pieces of information, it's a valid report. So very, very sparse data, potentially. It can go into a lot of detail, but it doesn't, doesn't have to. Okay. Although people are reporting their suspicion that an event is causal, it may in fact not be. We can't know. As I've shown you, we can have very large volumes of reports. And another big problem is that we can have duplicate cases. It could be that a patient reports about their own reaction, their treating physician reports it, and their pharmacist also reports it. And maybe none of them know that the others have reported it. And we may not realize that they all refer to the same patient. So it can be difficult to know whether they're duplicate reports. Okay. But nonetheless, this is still one of the key processes we use to find signals. And I've got a definition here of the, of the, the word signal in this context. And it's basically reported information that there's a possible causal relationship between an adverse event and a drug. And the important things are that either we didn't know about this combination of drug and event before, or that it was incompletely understood and that there's something new about the relationship that has now become apparent. Typically, we'd need more than one single report for it to be considered a signal. Um, but depends on the, the seriousness of the event. So it's quite a broad definition, but I think captures nicely what we would consider to be a drug safety signal. So what do we do? We capture all of these signals. How do we investigate them further? Well, we need a more formal 
methodology that doesn't have the same disadvantages as the spontaneous reporting system. And so the, the discipline that we then turn to is epidemiology. Now, hopefully to most of you, this won't be uh, a, new, a new idea. So you'll have some understanding of what we mean by epidemiology. And it's effectively, it's the study of how often diseases occur in different groups of people and why they occur. So we use epidemiological information to plan and evaluate strategies to prevent illness. And here, the idea of illness is going to be adverse drug reactions. Okay? Um, and there's a guide to managing patients in whom those illnesses or adverse reactions have already happened. This nicer, uh, kind of shorter definition of pharmacoepidemiology written by Brian Strom, I like. It's basically the study of the use and the effects of medications in large numbers of people. I, I actually really, really hate the term pharma. I mean, if you ever say to somebody that you're a pharmacoepidemiologist, unless they are, no one has a clue what you mean. So this is quite a nice, simple definition that I think most people do understand. So if anybody ever asks you, that's a great definition. So it is one of the key tools that we would use to try to investigate the signals that we might find through spontaneous reporting. But the application of the discipline is much, much broader than this, as you will see throughout this course. And so it can help us to understand the disease epidemiology or the indication for a treatment that we might be interested in, can help us to study drug utilisation, so who's using the drug. We can test hypotheses, but we can also start to generate hypotheses using pharmacoepidemiology. We can measure how effective we're being when we try to minimise risks. And we can also potentially use these methods to study real world effectiveness of treatments. And as we, as we move down this list, we're sort of, uh, some of these areas are more what may happen in the future or what is not happening very much right now, but it's like the cutting edge of what's happening in the discipline. Okay, pharmacoepidemiology has become a big part of what's expected in drug regulation throughout the world. And so in, in most regions of the world, there is now a big expectation that we will do some kind of formal risk management planning. And this was originally led largely by countries in the European Union, who developed a process called risk management plans. Similar, slightly different process in the United States with the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. And here in Japan, you also have a similar risk management process. They have it in Canada. Various countries throughout the world have a process for doing something along these lines. The details from one country to another may vary a little bit but the broad ideas are the same. So, back to this idea of what happens at the time a drug is licensed. So we know we've done all our randomised trials, we've put together a large dossier of information about the treatment, this has been assessed by the drug regulatory authorities, and they then get their licence. So you may think or hope that all is fine now, we know that the treatment is good. Well, we know a bit, but as I mentioned previously, there are lots of bits of information that we still don't know. And just to illustrate this, I've got this uh, slide here showing you, based on the number of people who have been exposed to a treatment in trials, what sort of adverse reactions could we have detected? So if we think about common adverse reactions, so something that happens to one in a hundred 
patients. We'd call that common, 1%. Well, if the spontaneous background incidence is 1 in 10,000, we would need to have had a number of 520 patients exposed in randomised trials for us to detect that reaction. Okay, well, we have a fair chance of being able to detect that in our randomised trials. But as we go down this list here, so if you've got a, an adverse reaction that happens in one in a thousand patients, now, that's fairly uncommon, but if you're treating millions of patients with a treatment, you will definitely have incidences of this reaction happening. But for you to have detected it in randomised trials, you may have needed over 130,000 people to have been exposed. So basically, at the point of licensing, we're not going to know about reactions that happen in one in a thousand people. And we certainly won't know about reactions that happen in one in 5,000 people. These will only come to light as the treatment is marketed widely and more people are exposed. So we need to have a process where we say, right at the point of licensing, how are we going to try to investigate this further now that the drug is marketed? And so this is the process of risk management planning. Again, it's relatively new. I'd say 20 years ago, this was not happening. And it was only around 20 years ago that this became a formal process. Now, the risk management plan, and I'm using the, the European template simply because it's the one that I know, but as I say, the broad principles are the same wherever you do it in the world. Okay. Now, the plan is split into seven sections. Some of them are a bit boring, so we're not going to talk about those. But what we are going to talk about are these four. So there's the safety specification, the pharmacovigilance plan, plans for post-authorization efficacy studies and risk minimization measures. The rest of it we're going to ignore because it's mostly kind of, well, it's dull. Um, so the safety specification. This, I think, is possibly one of the most important parts of the risk management plan at the point of licensing because it tells us, it puts together everything that we already know about the treatment. So it talks about all of the things that we found out in the preclinical toxicity testing. What do we know about pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics? And so there will be things that we can then think about because of that information, trying to guess what might the effects of the medication be. It'll also talk about how we think that the treatment will be used. So what sorts of patients are we hoping will become exposed to the drug? Um, it'll talk about the adverse event profile. So that's what do we already know? And this is your common adverse reactions, the one in a hundred, fairly common things that we've already seen. It may also consider class effects. So if this is the second or the third treatment within a class, and others have already been marketed, then you could also talk about what do we already know about this class of medications based on other, other drugs in the same class. It'll talk about either potential or known drug interactions, so interactions between treatments and problems that that might have. But it'll also give us a level of confidence with which we should interpret this information. It'll tell us about the population that was included in the randomised trials. So it'll give us a detailed breakdown of the sorts of patients who were included, how long that they were exposed to the treatment for, what doses were studied, but then really importantly, it'll also tell us who was not studied in the randomised trials. So did you have any children in the trial? Did you have any really elderly people? And the important thing is, you can then link this with 
how will it be used? Because within this same document, you will talk about who you expect to be exposed over time. And it could be that the who wasn't studied forms a large part of who you think it will be used in. And this is really useful information. So from these two, we will generate safety concerns, okay? We also have information about the disease itself. So the indication for the treatment, what's the epidemiology of that disease? What other diseases or illnesses does the expected population suffer? And this is then going to help us to interpret these safety concerns. And we split these into three bits of information. So we have important identified risks. So this is the which adverse reactions do we know are definitely associated with the drug and that we maybe need to investigate further. We have important potential risks. These may be theoretical adverse reactions that we haven't observed yet, but that we think we should be looking for because we know, based on maybe the pharmacokinetics and the preclinical toxicology, to expect that there could be a problem. So we call these potential risks. And then finally, we have missing information. This is important missing information that, based on all of this, we might say we really need to know what happens to people who've taken the treatment for more than two years because we think maybe there's a chance that it could cause a cancer. Well, we won't have seen that in the trials because people won't have had time to develop the cancer. Or it may be that we want to know what happens in a particular population, so people with renal failure, what happens in them. So we would call that missing information. Okay, so hopefully that's clear about what goes in the safety specification and why we would find that useful. Yeah? Okay. So knowing what we do about the safety profile, we would then put together a pharmacovigilance plan. And I should mention, the, the body that puts together this whole risk management plan is the drug company. So the company that wants the license for the treatment does all of this work, which we then present to the regulatory authority to see if they agree. Okay. So the pharmacovigilance plan is another really important part of this dossier because it talks about how we will then address the safety concerns. For sure, it will involve routine pharmacovigilance. So spontaneous reporting is always going to be a given. It will always be a part of this process. But two other really important parts are studies to investigate either identified or potential risks of the medication. And these are things that the company themselves can propose to do, but similarly, the regulatory authority could insist that the company does these studies as a, a part of the license. So it's possible that the company will be refused a license unless they commit to doing one of these studies. It's also important if we've got risks that we know about and we want to try to minimise those risks, so a really good example would be if we know that a treatment could cause a birth defect, then we may have a pregnancy prevention plan for that drug. So it would be really important to know how well is that plan working. So it would be then a study to investigate that risk minimization. Okay, so the next part of the plan is for post authorization effectiveness study. So remember we talked briefly about the difference between efficacy, that's our best treatment effect under very controlled conditions in a very, very narrow study population. Whereas effectiveness is the effect that we actually get under routine clinical care. And at the point of licensing, 
if there is some doubt over how this if efficacy translates into effectiveness, again, the regulatory authority can insist that as a part of the license, the company does further studies to demonstrate the effect in routine care. This is a very recent development in drug regulation that has made it very um, important that the efficacy that they demonstrate at the point of licensing does translate into real world effects. And there can be all sorts of reasons why at the point of licensing we may not know the true effects and this can be due to things like surrogate endpoints. So for example we may have uh, a new treatment to lower cholesterol. Well we may want to lower cholesterol, in fact we will only want to lower cholesterol because we hope we will prevent future myocardial infarctions or stroke. But it may be that the trial didn't demonstrate that clinical benefit. Well the regulators could then insist that a future study be done to demonstrate the clinical benefit. Um, vaccines will typically demonstrate an immunological response as part of the licensing process, but they won't have been tested on an entire population within a country, which is what really matters. For some vaccines is that we're lowering the level of an infection at the population level. So it may then be important that the company commits to doing in different countries in the world, these studies to demonstrate how the vaccine is working. Okay? The conditions of care under, under routine care can be quite different to in a randomised trial. And maybe as part of the treatment, it's important that you're regularly measuring something to do with the patient. So let's say it's a trial in HIV it may be important that you're able to measure maybe CD4 count because it may lead you to make different changes to the patient's treatment. And you'll do that very well potentially in randomised trials, but maybe in routine care you don't get to see the patient as often and it could be that the effectiveness is lower in routine care than it would be under trial conditions. And then it could be that as the, as the treatment is available for a few years, for some other reason, new information comes to light that means that we need to reevaluate effectiveness. So there can be lots of reasons why we want to know more about effectiveness. Okay, so moving on to the, the final part of the plan that I think is of great interest is risk minimization. Now, we've already mentioned some of these. So risk minimization is when we want to prevent or to reduce identified risks. And so a really great example is a pregnancy prevention plan. Uh, a, a good example of one that's been had difficulties recently is sodium valproate. It's a treatment for epilepsy. And we've known that there are problems with valproate causing birth defects for a long time. But we haven't necessarily been as effective as we thought in preventing pregnancy in women who take valproate. Another good example is the antipsychotic treatment clozapine. So this is a, a very effective treatment, but it's also quite toxic and can cause very nasty white blood cell problems and in extreme cases can cause death due to a granulocytosis. So this was discovered back in the 1970s, I think, and so it soon became apparent that you could only give this treatment to people if they were having regular monitoring of their white blood cell counts. So it became uh, a requirement that all patients taking clozapine had to have prove that they had a test that showed their white cell count was good before the pharmacist would release their next box of clozapine. So in fact this all hinged on the pharmacist. The doctor would make the prescription but the pharmacist would not give the treatment unless the patient produced this blood cell count that was okay. And this has been a phenomenally effective way 
of allowing people to benefit from receiving clozapine but without the catastrophic effects on white blood cell counts. Another great example is in the world of HIV and a, a treatment called a Bacavir. Now Bacavir again when it was launched in the 1990s was a very effective antiretroviral but it also caused a uh, an adverse reaction, an allergic reaction, in about 4% of people exposed to the treatment. Now usually, most people would just have a fairly mild allergic reaction. But if they ever received a back of ear again, it would be a much more severe reaction and often was fatal. Now, this was another position where you had potentially a very effective treatment but also potentially a very toxic treatment. And eventually it was realised that I think pretty much everybody who had the allergic response also carried a particular genetic allele which was easily tested for. And so as soon as the, the company introduced testing, this genetic testing, it meant that people would then be safe to receive a Bacavir and wouldn't have the allergic reaction. So these are all examples of risk minimization measures and we can put those in place but we need to do more than that. We need to prove that they've had the desired effect and so we often need to do studies to show that these have been effective measures. Okay. Now depending on who you ask. Epidemiology and pharmacoepidemiology can be considered to be only to do with observational or non-randomised studies. Now personally and at the School of Hygiene we consider pharmacoepidemiology to involve both non-randomised and randomised studies. So that's just to make clear to you over the next couple of days. I'll talk to you about examples where it's both either randomised or non-randomised uh, studies. And I think we can potentially use both of these kinds of studies to try to investigate things like risk minimisation or to investigate safety signals further. So just to clarify, that's what I mean. I think that the two kinds of evidence that we get from both trials and non-randomised studies can be complementary. And I've got a couple of slides explaining why I think they're complementary and what the different strengths and weaknesses are. So, first of all, if we think about the number of patients included in a study, in our pre-marketing randomised trials, it's going to be low. Whereas, if we're going to do an observational study, especially if we're going to use electronic health records, then potentially we can include very large numbers of patients. For the duration of treatment or follow-up, again in our pre-marketing trials, this is going to be fairly short. Whereas in our observational studies, we can look over potentially decades if we've got the information, which again we will often have in electronic health records. We can look over very long periods to see what's happening. The cost of a pre-marketing randomised trial, as I'm sure you're all aware, is very expensive. Whereas non-randomised studies tend to be much cheaper to do, particularly if we're relying on data that's already been recorded as part of an electronic health record. Even randomised trials of treatments where we're not going to expose people for very long, maybe they're only going to be exposed for six months or a year, they will still take a very long time to do for the drug company from starting the trial, enrolling the first patients, continuing to enrol which can take several years and then finalising the study can be a very long process. The non-randomised studies, particularly if we rely on data that's already been recorded in the past will be much quicker to do. Although you may be surprised, and Masao will maybe talk about this on Friday, the length of time to do an observational study is still probably longer than you may imagine. 
but still much quicker than a, a randomized trial. Um, the ethics of the studies are very different. So the, if the ethics of a randomized trial may mean that we can't do a study. So if there's already a clear known benefit of a treatment, we may not be able to randomize people to that treatment, whereas we can do an observational study where we simply look at what did people prescribe for their clinical reasons. The patients that we include in the study in a, a pre-marketing trial will tend not to represent the population that will be exposed, whereas if we're looking at observational data, especially electronic health records, then it will be driven entirely by people from the general population. Okay, so from, from that slide you would think, I imagine that only non-randomized studies are very good. <coughs> it's not the case at all. Um, so, pre-marketing trials, patients will receive extremely good care and it means that we have a really good chance of being able to see what is the true effect or the best effect of a treatment. In routine care or observational studies, patients don't receive the best clinical care, they just receive normal clinical care, which can mean that we don't see the same effects. <coughs> Of course, the key advantage of the randomized trial is that treatment allocation is made at random, which means that when we come to make inference about causes and effects, we have the best chance possible in a randomized trial. Okay? In our observational studies, the treatment is decided by the, the healthcare professional and the patient, and of course is driven by clinical need, all sorts of considerations, and so it means that when we come to make inference about cause and effect, it's much more problematic. <clears throat> so our, our randomized trials are much less prone to bias compared with the observational studies. Who has come across the term hierarchy of evidence before? A few people. Now, if you Google hierarchy of evidence, you will find a million different diagrams that all look depressingly exactly like this. They're all the same. Now, and they all have meta-analysis and systematic review at the very pinnacle of this hierarchy, and then we go down to individual randomized trial, then cohort study, case control study, cross-sectional study, animal trials, case reports and opinion. And they all have this exact same structure and that we should only view evidence in this way. Now personally, I don't like these hierarchies because I think that they invite us as investigators to be quite lazy in the way that we think about what's the question that I'm asking? What's the research question? and what's the best evidence for that research question. And I'm going to demonstrate to you why I think this. But before I do, I want to make really clear that I'm not in any way saying anything bad about randomised trials. I think randomised trials are one of the best ways we have to assess the effect of a treatment on an outcome. So I would say to you, that if we've got a situation where we've got one single research question, okay, does this treatment cause this adverse effect? And we've got a, a given population, the population of Japan, let's say, and we have two options. We can either randomize within the population in Japan who could receive that treatment, or we can do an observational study where we simply look at what happened in routine clinical care. But remember, so this randomized population is going to be drawn at random from the whole population. So we're not excluding pregnant women, we're not excluding children, it's a genuine population sample. If we're in that situation, I'm always going to trust the results of the randomized trial more 
then I'll trust the results of the observational study. There's no doubt about that in my mind. But I think that this situation is very rare. I don't often find myself faced with a research question where I've got either of both of these options available to me. But just to be clear, if I do, I'm always going to trust the randomised trial. Okay, so I want to get that out of the way before I then go on to say what I'm going to say. So I want to show you a different example now, and it's the example of COX-2 inhibitors. So these are the most recent class of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. I'm sure you'll be familiar with them. And the trials, the pre-marketing trials, showed that they had improved safety compared with the older non-steroidals, specifically in terms of their gastrointestinal bleeding risk. And it was the reason that they were developed with because the mechanism meant it was much less likely you would have a GI bleed with them compared with the older versions. The trouble is, when people did observational studies, this benefit didn't seem to be there. Now, has anybody got any ideas why this might have been the case? Why would the trials show a gastrointestinal benefit, but the observational studies in real world usage showed very little or no benefit? Why might that be the case? Any thoughts? Yep, yeah, so the, the randomised trials before marketing showed that the new COX-2 inhibitors had less gastrointestinal bleeding associated with them than the older non-steroidals like ibuprofen, naproxen. They had more GI bleed, the COX-2 inhibitors less GI bleed. That's the trials, so we, we believe that that was a causal difference. But when people did observational studies using electronic health records, they couldn't find a difference in the GI bleeding between the two. And I'm asking, can anybody think of any reasons why that might be the case? Adherence. Adherence, Adherence could be one, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it could be that adherence was very different. It, yeah, it would mean that we were studying people not really taking much of anything, which could be true, yeah. Uh, using other medicine at the same time? Ah, say more. So what might they be using? Maybe they use for hypertension or other disease, they use different medicine and this affects mm -hmm. Yeah, it could have been due to taking other medicine. It could specifically, in this instance, have been due to taking gastroprotective treatments. That could have been happening differently. So that's one, one possibility as well. Any others? To be the population, they have the series of diseases to prevent. Yes, the series of diseases. Yes, they maybe suffer from different diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so you've got some great reasons though. So that final one was to do with confounding, where you maybe were treating quite different types of people with the COX-2 inhibitors and the NSAIDs and another one. I think the time of the taking, the time of taking the drugs, I mean, even on that trial, will you restart with the initiator? Uh-huh. 
Ah, okay, this is another really good point. So if we were starting our observational studies amongst people who've already taken the treatment for some time, then we may come to a false conclusion. So uh, it's great, you've picked some reasons that may be to do with the observational study not being very well done. So for example, taking prevalent users would be a problem. If we couldn't adjust for the baseline differences between our populations, that would also be a big problem. And uh, we also have the suggestion that maybe the people in the trials are quite different from the people in routine care, or maybe they're taking different treatments, or maybe they're adherents. And these are all great problems that we have to think about when we're doing non-randomized studies. Now, in fact, what happened was, and there's a great paper here by uh, an investigator called Thierd Van Star, and he found that on average, in the trials, people were exposed to the COX-2 inhibitors for between six and nine months. So fairly long, longish term treatment. And they mostly had rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, that was the population studied in the trials. Now these new COX-2 inhibitors were much more expensive than the older non-steroidals, which were very cheap. But they said, the company said, it's fine because we have this big, big benefit. People on these new treatments will not get GI bleeds. So although the cost of the treatment is more, the overall cost of treatment for patients will be probably lower or similar because they won't be having these GI bleeds, they won't go to hospital, so things will be better. Now in fact, what they found was that the average length of exposure in routine clinical care, once the treatments have been launched, was one or two months. So people were maybe only being given one prescription. And then that would then lead to the most they could take it for in the UK would be one month. But it's possible to come back to your point about adherence. Maybe they took the treatment for a week and then they didn't need it anymore. So they, they didn't take very much of it. The thing is, in these short exposure periods, people would then not have such a high risk of a GI bleed that would take some time to develop. So, in fact, it was all to do with the treatment populations being quite different. The indication that people were given the treatment for in routine care was often things like a, maybe some kind of sports injury. So not rheumatoid arthritis and not requiring long-term treatment. So the claimed benefit in the trials just wasn't translated to routine care. And we could never have known that by doing a randomised trial. We could only know by actually looking what's happening in routine care. And is this benefit real? Or in fact, is it pointless to pay so much more money for the new treatment when in fact the benefit that you claim won't apply to this population? So I give that as an example where I think the hierarchy of evidence would not be very helpful because you need to think about what's the research question I'm trying to ask and what's the best evidence for that research question, okay? But I do want people to stay wary of the results of observational studies too. So another example I have is of hormone replacement therapy, which we give a symptomatic relief from menopausal symptoms. But for a long time, there was a perceived idea that HRT would also reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and of Alzheimer's. This was partly circumstantial evidence that people looked at women pre and post menopause and found that post menopause, the risk of heart disease and Alzheimer's was higher. There were marker studies looking at um, blood markers of disease that again showed that post-menopause it may be, or people on HRT maybe had a lower risk of these diseases. And there were some specific observational pharmacoepi studies that showed it to be an advantage. Now then in 2002, 
there was a large randomised trial called the Women's Health Initiative which reported an increased risk of cardiovascular disease amongst women taking HRT. So this was the opposite of what we expected. They also had an increased risk of breast cancer but a reduced risk of fractures. So this was all not what we expected based on the observational results. So what went wrong? Well, there's a great commentary here written at the time by Debbie Lawler. And if you're interested, I suggest you go and find this. It's a great, great paper to read, not just about HRT, but about what can go wrong with observational studies of drug effects in general. What happened was the, the people who were exposed and unexposed to HRT were fundamentally different. Healthy women tended to take HRT. Now, healthy women would tend to have less heart disease. So there's one problem. Some of the studies used prevalent users. So they didn't start at the point in time where women started their treatment with HRT. In fact, if you're going to have a heart problem with HRT, it will happen close to the start of treatment. So if we kill all of those women with HRT and then start to study the women that can continue taking it longer term, they're going to look much healthier. So it's a problem. This is a major issue in pharmacoepidemiology. And in this instance, randomized evidence was the key. So I hope you take away from this that I believe that randomized and non-randomized studies are complementary and that it depends very much What's the question that we're trying to answer? Sometimes one will be better than the other. Now, I want to finish with what I see as being one of the biggest challenges to those of us that do pharmacoepidemiology studies. And I've got here a graph produced by a PhD student of mine called John Tazare, and it shows you the explosion in the number of studies published using electronic health records. Now I started doing these kinds of studies here in 2005 and this is just primary care publications from using UK data. Okay, so it's, very, it's, a, it's a small field but it's representative of the rest of the world. And there were about 75 articles a year back in 2005. In 2017 there were 225 articles a year and this is the same whatever data source you look at. There's been an explosion in the use of these data. Now what I would say is what really matters is quality, not quantity. So in a way it's great that the data are being used more and more, but we want to make sure that the evidence that they generate is good. And I see all the time examples that are very often published in uh, widespread, widespread media that, that everybody reads where I can see that there are big problems. So here's an example, it's really, uh, again from a UK newspaper and statins are often in the news for causing problems and it will often then lead to people stopping their statin. What we do know is that statins do prevent heart disease. So we know that people stopping their statin will lead to heart disease. And often the reason that they stop is because they're worried because somebody's done a study where they show an association between statins and some harmful effects, which then gets misconstrued as being causal. So I think this is a problem. Another recent example is the proton pump inhibitors. Now I have a personal um, interest in PPIs because I think that they get blamed for a lot of harm that they don't cause. And here was a study that showed people on PPIs being more likely to die than people not taking PPIs. And I agree, I'm absolutely certain that the sort of people who get given PPIs die more often than the sort of people who do not get given PPIs. I think it's because they're sick, not because the PPIs are killing them. I think it's very hard for us to prove that or to show that using observational evidence. But my worry is that people see these kinds of headlines and then decide to stop taking their PPI, which is actually giving them relief from gastric symptoms. So I think that 
This explosion in the use of data to generate evidence brings a big problem in terms of how we communicate and how the, the wider world understands evidence and causal associations. Okay, so to quickly summarize, uh, so I think pharmacovigilance has developed massively over the last 50 years. Pharmacoepi is a very important tool for us to assess several different areas of pharmacovigilance. It's fully embedded in the risk management process throughout the world. There's a massive growth in the use of electronic health records to investigate the effects of medications. And I think we need to be extremely careful how we interpret these studies and that we do the best kinds of studies that we can because we're trying to get to causal effects but it can often be very difficult. Okay.